Our next speaker and the final speaker for this session before the poster session is Professor Yongbek Kim from the University of Toronto. Today he's going to talk about towards fractal-like phases and frustrated magnets. Okay, you can, you, you can hear me? Okay, great. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizer for uh, inviting me to this interesting conference. I'm not sure whether uh, organizers had this topic in mind when they, when they invited me. Maybe they were thinking about condo effect, but uh, uh, somehow I decided to talk about this topic. So, um, so this work is about uh, <clears throat> you know whether it's possible to um, uh, come up with uh, some realistic theoretical model uh, that could be realized in real material. That's basically the motivation to uh, 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 think about this work. So, uh, what kind of properties we want to have uh, in this kind of system? As explained earlier, uh, we like to have, say, some quasi particles with uh, restricted mobility. So, one explicit example was already discussed. This is XQ model. The downside of this model, of course, is that you have to deal with this uh, 12, 12 spin interaction. This, pre pre this presumably uh, hard to achieve in real system. Um, second interesting property was uh, this sub extensive uh, ground state degeneracy. Uh, that depends on the geometry of the lattice. And this is the ground state degeneracy of XQ model with the periodic boundary condition. So, uh, as previous speakers explained, uh, there are lots of work, uh, you know, trying to uh, come up with a continuum field theory. There's also a relation to uh, uh, elasticity theory. And the connection I'd like to make today is uh, mainly to this rank to uh, tensor gauge theory. Uh, this connection was initially made by uh, Pretko. So, what is that? So, uh, this is rather elementary discussion. So, for the usual uh, U1 gauge theory or the usual electromagnetism that we know of, uh, we have this Gauss law constraint. Uh, if there is no if, if there is no uh, uh, external charges, but uh, this will be changed to some Poisson situation if there is a, 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 a external charge charge in the system. So, this is the corresponding. Um, uh, uh, gauge principle. Uh, now you can think about um, generalizing this to uh, rank two theory. What, you know, what that simply means is that uh, instead of thinking about a vector electric field, we want to think about this uh, two index uh, tensor uh, gauge field. So it just becomes a, a two index tensor. So there are, then there are two different ways to think about a Gauss law. So you just make this uh, uh, two derivatives here. Uh, then the corresponding charge will be a scalar charge. If you, if you only use the single derivative to define a Gauss law, then your charge will be a vector uh, uh, gauge charge. And there are corresponding uh, gauge transformation. So the reason why this construction is interesting uh, is because, for example, imagine that I have this, uh, this kind of Gauss law with the scalar charge. Uh, then well, what, that, what that means at the end of the day, so your total charge is conserved, but your, your dipole moment is also conserved. So you have a two conservation law, not just charge conservation, you also have a, a dipole conservation. So in this case, so for example, imagine that I created a, a charge configuration like this. It's a quarter polar configuration. If your total charge is zero, the dipole moment is also zero. So I can move those charges or I can create more excitation in this way, but I have to make sure that the both conservation laws are satisfied. So in that sense, uh, rank two theory has certain uh, uh, mobility constraint, mobility restriction. Uh, you can do the similar thing for uh, uh, vector charge theory here. Uh, then the, again, the total charge is conserved, but then this quantity also has to be conserved. And because of this, uh, uh, you can easily see that the motion of the charge is restricted along the basic charge vector direction. The perpendicular direction, these charges cannot move. So again, the simple theory is you know, just a simple generalization of usual electromagnetism. Already tells you that you can sort of generate a mobility, restri mobility uh, restrictions. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna use this uh, 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 kind of analogy uh, to construct um, uh, uh, some kind of spin model only with the two spin exchange interaction on what we call a breathing particle lattice. Uh, sorry. Uh, on the breathing particle lattice, 
So this work was uh, done in collaboration with two people. So Adash Patry uh, was my former student. He's now a postdoctoral fellow at MIT. Sangen Han is a, a postdoctoral fellow at Toronto. Okay, so this is the lattice that I like to work with. So, so this is the, uh, what people call breathing particle lattice. So it's the usual, uh, think about the usual particle lattice first. That's the corner sharing tetrahedron. Uh, and uh, uh, so, but in this case, what happens is that the size of the A tetrahedron uh, and then B tetrahedron is different. So what, this, what that means is that the spin exchange interaction on different uh, tetrahedron are different. In fact, uh, I'm going to assume that the interaction on the B tetrahedron is order of magnitude smaller uh, than the interaction on the A tetrahedron. So for example, uh, this material, uh, the ytterbium carries the uh, uh, spin half moment uh, and ytterbium actually ion, magnetic ions are sitting on such a lattice. So, 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 so the material like that actually exists. Okay, um, so with this, um, since I don't want to draw this three-dimensional lattice structure on a two-dimensional plane all the time. It's kind of difficult. So I'm going to use a simplified representation here. So this, uh, you know, if this is the uh, particle lattice, uh, then there are A and B tetrahedron, or up tetrahedron, down tetrahedron. So instead of using this, uh, I'm going to represent uh, on the center position of this tetrahedron. And you know that if you connect centers of uh, uh, the all the tetrahedron, there's a diamond lattice. And diamond lattice consists of two sub lattices. Each sub lattice has FTC lattice. So all the up tetrahedrons are on some F FTC lattice, the green dots. And all the B tetrahedron, the yellow one, are sitting at uh, another FTC lattice, the two interpenetrating FTC lattices. So this is the representation I'm going to use the rest of the talk. And this is the model that I like to work with. This is actually the most general, most generic uh, two-spin exchange interaction, the nearest neighbor interaction uh, on such a lattice. So this Heisenberg interaction, the usual one, I'm going to assume that this is anti-ferromagnetic. And this is jalochinsky moria And there's a famous uh, Kitaev interaction. There's a bond-dependent Ising interaction. And this also a symmetric uh, anisotropic exchange interaction. It's a symmetric version of the uh, jalochinsky moria so if this sign was negative, this will be a jalotinsky moria interaction. But now this sign is plus, that's why it's called symmetric exchange. Um, so this is a very general, basically, if you only think about a nearest neighbor interaction, this is the most generic interaction. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm also going to assume the interactions on the B tetrahedron are much smaller than those on the A tetrahedron. And I also going, I'm also going to assume that Heisenberg interaction dominates over other anisotropic interactions. And this is a very general uh, assumption. And this happens uh, all the time in lateral material. Okay. So now, instead of working with this uh, microscopic spin model, it turns out it is useful to uh, rewrite the model using the uh, basically normal mode of these all the spins on each tetrahedron. So, so this is like uh, trying to write down the normal mode of a spin on each tetrahedron. So think about this as a, some kind of molecule. And uh, normally, when you, when you uh, say, want to describe some vibrational normal mode of the molecule, then you use the group theory to, to represent all the normal mode. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So I can write down all the uh, normal mode of a spin in terms of uh, irreducible representation of the tetrahedral group. So, so I can label those normal modes. There are normal modes on the A tetrahedron. There's a normal mode on the B tetrahedron. But remember that each spin belongs to both A tetrahedron and B tetrahedron. So you always have double counting. That's why there's one half factor here, one half factor here. So then I have all the right degree of freedom. So you may wonder what it looks like. Uh, it looks, you know, the actual expression is quite complicated. It looks like this. And remember that there are four sides and each spin has X, Y, Z component. There are 12 degrees of freedom. So some linear combination of those will give you this normal mode. So you don't need to know the details. It's just that I can write down uh, the, that microscopic model uh, precisely in terms of this normal mode representation. And uh, you can make a connection uh, between those variables, like uh, those A are basically uh, uh, essentially energy cost uh, to excite this particular normal mode. 
And this energy cost for each normal mode can be represented explicitly in terms of those exchange interaction constant. So there's a precise mapping between these two models. Okay. Now I'm going, as I said, I'm going to assume that the Heisenberg interaction basically dominates and these onacidic interactions are smaller. And, I, and then if you look at this expression, then you immediately realize that the, the heaviest mode or the, the highest energy mode is this uh, Q1 plus mode. And I like to work in the energy scale below this uh, uh, excitation energy scale. So we can such that we can basically remove this mode uh, and saying that these are high energy modes, so I'm gonna get rid of this. And, and my active degree of freedom will be the rest of the uh, normal mode. Okay, now by the time you do this, especially when you remove uh, uh, one of those modes for the beta tetrahedron, it has an immediate consequence to uh, normal mode uh, on the eight tetrahedron. The region is as follows. So as I said, each spin belongs to both A tetrahedron and B tetrahedron. So if I remove some mode on the B tetrahedron, what happens is that there are some constraints imposed on normal modes of the nearby four, tet four A tetrahedron. So they are not independent. They are all connected to each other. And I, when I impose this condition, so it generates a constraint on the normal mode of A tetrahedron. And if you actually work out when go to a continuum limit, and because of the fact that these constraints are uh, acting on uh, four separated tetrahedron, when you go to continuum limit, uh, you have a gradient operator, and you you you, you can you can you can derive this equation that just the constraint equation on the all the normal mode, and you can write this nicely as a Gauss law uh, if you define. Uh, electric field tensor like this. So this is the symmetric part of this, uh, uh, what, you, what I call, a, what I call two, uh, 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 rank two uh, electric field tensor. So it consists of E mode, so-called E mode and T1 minus mode. And there's a traceable part, this is diagonal, and this is anti-symmetric part. So nice thing is that if you rearrange those normal mode variable uh, this way, then uh, the entire thing becomes a rank two electric field tensor. And the, this, this constraint you generate becomes uh, uh, the Gauss law. So at least at the classical level, uh, you can achieve uh, uh, this rank two uh, field theory, if you like, or rank two electrodynamics, electrodynamics theory with the, with the Gauss law constraint. So this is kind of nice. Okay, in particular, uh, you can simplify the theory a little bit. Uh, say, uh, imagine that I, I tune the parameters of the exchange interaction such that uh, these two modes are degenerate and they are basically low energy mode. So the energy cost for all other normal modes are higher. And this is the lowest energy mode. I, I, I like to keep only those guys. So if, if you do so, <clears throat> uh, then what happens is that uh, you can, you can um, basically select only the symmetric path of the uh, uh, rank two electric field tensor. And this model becomes a traceless symmetric tensor gauge theory with this uh, nice Gauss law constraint. And this is something that a uh, lot of uh, uh, field theory folks like to work with. So there are ways to get there. And this is not difficult. Uh, basically, you just have to turn off all the Kitaev and gamma interaction if you only have Heisenberg and uh, Chalosinski Moria interaction, you can achieve that. So it's, you know, this is pretty general. Uh, it's, it's not difficult to achieve this uh, uh, regime. Okay. Um, and one in interesting experimental consequence of uh, such a state, at, at the moment I'm talking about the classical theory, is that uh, instead of uh, uh, usual two, two-fold pinch point you see in a quantum spin ice kind of a state, uh, you, you, in, in the, in the polarized uh, neutral scattering channel, if you look at spin flip scattering, then, uh, uh, both in the elastic and inelastic scattering channel, you are supposed to see this fourfold, uh, pinch point. And the reason for that is pretty simple. In a usual rank one gauge theory, uh, the usual Gauss law gives you this trans facility condition for the electric field, electric field correlator. For rank two theory, one can show that it becomes like this. And in particular, this part uh, shows up in the polar and neutron scattering intensity, and that's the reason why you get a four-pole, uh, uh, you know, pinch point sing singularity. So, you know, there's a 
definite experimental consequence for that. Now, the thing is, this, so far I talked about classical model, but what about uh, quantum model? Okay. So the question is, you know, can I quantize this? Uh, you need to realize that this is very difficult because this normal modes are essentially spin variable, right? So, so far I treated, the, treated them classically. But if you, if you now, if you are trying to quantize this, and you realize that this uh, 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 the rank to electric field tensor are basically non-commuting field, right? This is different, right? For you, in the usual electrical dynamics, electric field themselves, you know, they, they, they are not, they are not non-commuting. So, you know, in some sense, it becomes a very complicated quantum field theory. So, in fact, we couldn't solve uh, this model. So this general model cannot be solved. But there are ways to uh, make a progress. So we decided to look at a different limit. Here, I choose to work with uh, uh, this, this particular mode, A2 mode and E mode. And I will tell you what this means in terms of microscopic Hamiltonian. So in the low energy mode, I decide, we decide to work with this uh, this limit, we, we only keep A2 mode and E mode. All other modes are, say, at higher energy. In this case, in terms of uh, uh, rank to electric field tensor, it turns out uh, I only keep a diagonal component. So from the symmetric part, I only keep the diagonal part. The traceful part also is also diagonal. Uh, so the price you have to pay is that uh, is, you know, trace is not zero, it's not trace list but it is still symmetric and diagonal. So if you work with this, uh, then this model can be solved nicely. And by the way, uh, you can achieve this uh, uh, by, by making use of uh, all of the exchange interaction. It turns out I had, I had, I had to tune one parameter. Uh, the, I had to choose uh, the ratio between uh, symmetric anisotropic interaction, charlottes moria interaction to be like square root of two. So I, I had to tune one parameter, but you, you can achieve this uh, in principle. So now let's work with this, um, uh, this limit where I have symmetric diagonal part of the symmetric tensor. And there's a part that has a finite trace, but this guy now satisfied the Gauss law. It turns out this model can be solved. So, and the, the, it's very simple actually. So, since these two modes are degenerate, the mass is the same, or the energy cost is the same, and uh, then I can rewrite this in terms of this uh, new electric field variable, and this is diagonal, so just that, you know, x, x, y, y, z, z component is all diagonal, and especially uh, if, you regard the, if you regard them as x, y, z component of some kind of electric field vector, then they satisfy usual SU2 commutation relation, just like ordinary spin. And we should not forget that there is actually an interaction in the B tetrahedral sector. This will play a very important role. And this guy will act as a, a perturbation. Okay. Now the point is, by the time you arrive at this representation, we know how to solve this, right? Because uh, the, the commutation relation between E square and the G component of this electric field satisfy this commutation relation. This is just like a you know, commutation relation between S square and S chat. So I can label all the quantum state using quantum numbers like S and S jet, right? I can label all the, all the state of the Hamiltonian. It turns out in this limit for each tetrahedron, the ground state is five-pole degenerate uh, and uh, all, the, all the ground state is represented by S equal two quantum numbers. So S equal two, S jet is my, from minus two to two. What that means is that the value, the allowed values of electric field is between minus two and two. It's pretty simple. And, and the ground state manifold of a network of eight tetrahedron, therefore, now is described as equal to multiplet, but they have to satisfy Gauss law constraint. So all the complication really comes from this Gauss law. The model itself is very simple. And, and you, can, you can see uh, that there is actually massive degeneracy because of this uh, Gauss law constraint. And the model is, is, looks deceptively simple, but all, again, all the complications are in the Gauss law, not in, not in the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, for example, um, remember that I have an electric field on the, on the centers of the uh, A tetrahedron. This is the location of B tetrahedron. So, in the ground state, in the ground state, we have to satisfy the Gauss law. 
So, so, uh, so this is the discrete version of the Gauss law. This is the electric field, the X component electric field, and uh, at uh, zero, one, two, three tetrahedron, a tetrahedron. And the grounds that this has to be zero because Gauss law is basically tells you that uh, this is zero, this is this is zero. But now, if you can you can uh, uh, you can uh, create a charge. In this case, you have a vector charge. Remember. Uh, but it should be at the location of the p-tetrahedron. So these are the uh, x, y, g component of, uh, say, charges at the p-tetrahedron site, so center of the p-tetrahedron. And since these are also spin variable, they also satisfy uh, SU2 commutation relation. So these are sort of spin of charges uh, in, in that sense, right? So, so, so this acts like a spin, okay? So this will be your, your Poisson situation, for example. Okay, and also uh, by thinking about um, this combination, and this guy actually acts like a, a raising and lowering operator. So by using those raising and lowering operator, I can create, I can uh, increase or decrease uh, those charges at the B tetrahedron center. So, so these are my uh, basic operators. Good. So now, uh, interesting point here. You so see, now I want to use this uh, Hamiltonian in the beta trident as a perturbation. And you can show that uh, this, the beta trident part of the Hamiltonian uh, gives you something like a creation and uh, annihilation operator of this combination. And remember, notice that these operators are acting on uh, two nearby uh, eta trident uh, 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 center. So it's, it's the interaction between is a, a tetrahedron, a prime tetrahedron. So this can be between one and two, or two and three, or zero and three, and things like that. Okay. So now let's see uh, uh, what goes on if I apply this perturbation to uh, a degenerate ground state. So uh, imagine that I start from some background electric field configuration that satisfy Gauss law constraint. And if I just apply a um, creation operator at, at one of the A tetrahedron center. And then you can show that you basically create a, a quadrupolar-like charge configuration like this. So this, so this is the position of the A tetrahedron. This is, this is the position of the A tetrahedron. And those guys are the positions of the B tetrahedron. This is the top view of a more three-dimensional picture like this. And remember that every dot it represents the one tetrahedron. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a large structure. Okay. So if you do this, then remember that uh, in the in the perturbation Hamiltonian, um, I have to apply E plus and E minus at nearby uh, a tetrahedron site. So if I apply this, this is basically the result of the per, applying a perturbative Hamiltonian. Then uh, uh, you create a quadrupolar charge configuration like this, quadrupolar charge configuration like that. And notice that uh, at the center, basically, those charges are canceled. So the charges are canceled in the bulk. Now you keep doing this. You apply uh, this, the same perturbation multiple times. You keep doing that. Then you create more charges at the boundary. Then you keep canceling the charge in the bulk. And then um, you keep doing that. And again, the same thing. Uh, sorry. And then again, uh, you know, you are creating a, a charges as a boundary, but uh, basically there's no bulk charges. And you do this, you keep doing this, and if you impose a periodic boundary condition, then at the end of the day, all the boundary charges are canceled out, and you go back to one of the uh, degenerate ground state manifold, one of the state in the ground state manifold. If you keep doing this, if you keep doing this, then you can generate all the degenerate ground state that are allowed by Gauss law constraint. So this is similar to uh, the case of quantum mole state. Remember that in the quantum mole state, one way to generate a degenerate ground state is to create quasi-particle, quasi or pair. You move them around uh, one of the uh, handles of the torus, then you annihilate them, you can go to the another ground state. Here, what happens is that I create this uh, uh, actually, membrane-like excitation, all the charges at the boundary. Basically, you're wrapping up uh, all the wrapping up the torus entirely. And when you go to when you when you wrap them up, when you wrap it up, and uh, when they cancel each other at the boundary, um, 
Uh, then basically you can go to uh, another ground state in the same in the in, in the ground state digital, ground state uh, uh, digital manifold. Is that I hope it I hope I hope that's clear. Okay. Good. Okay. So uh, what what is the what is the ground state degeneracy with the periodic boundary condition? Um, we couldn't find the analytical formula. Okay, maybe it's a smarter person in the audience who can do this, but at least I could, we couldn't do it. So we counted the 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 the, DJ, the, the ground state degeneracy uh, by brute force. So so we use the computer to count it. So 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 it depends on the system size, and uh, this is the uh, basic unit that I'm working with. So uh, remember that those those dots are actually tetrahedron. So I have a tetrahedron, b tetrahedron. So in this one unit, I think I have like um, of at least four tetrahedron inside. And so now you, this is so this is this is what I mean by uh, Lx equals one, Ly equals one, Lz equals one. Okay. So then uh, by increasing the system size, Lx, Ly, Lz, and this is these are this is the volume and this is the perimeter of the system. And I count, we counted the graph of degeneracy, and we got these numbers. Okay. And then uh, we found that ground state is, degeneracy is different for uh, the same volume or perimeter. For example, if you look at, uh, you know, this guy is same as the same perimeter. Ground state degeneracy is different, right? Those guys have same volume, but the ground state degeneracy is again different. So it doesn't simply depend on either volume or perimeter. Uh, for a fixed parameter, uh, perimeter, for a fixed perimeter like this, a larger volume gives you actually smaller ground state degeneracy. It's counterintuitive. For a fixed volume, though, for a fixed volume, a larger perimeter gives you a larger ground state degeneracy. So uh, we found that uh, if you have a you know arrangement in you know, a one-dimensional direction only, uh, then ground state degeneracy uh, monotonically increases the system size. In all other cases, that's not the case. Uh, the ground state degeneracy does not monotonically increase the volume of perimeter. In fact, ground state degeneracy is larger for larger parameters for a given volume. And this, we can understand this way. Uh, so uh, you notice that the number of times that this uh, membrane-like object uh, uh, can be applied, it depends on the number of, pl number of possible planes in your system, and for FC Celaris, there are, there are L, L time, you know, two times L sub i number of planes in each direction. And the total number of planes is this, right? Total number of planes is this. Therefore, uh, you know, remember that uh, uh, each time I apply a membrane like operator, I can, you know, generate a new ground state. So more, you know, presence of more operator like this means that I can, you know, the, ground, num the number of ground state must be larger. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for a given parameter, ground state is smaller for larger volume. And this is because um, the number of constraints actually increases with the volume. So this is a competition between uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the number of membrane operators and uh, the number of constraints. So that's why the relation is not so simple. Okay. So at the end of the day, uh, conclusion is that the ground state degeneracy is non extensive with the volume, and it actually depends on the um, geometry. So in that sense, um, it has a fractal-like uh, behavior. Okay, so so far I talked about uh, only the electric field. You may ask me, where is the magnetic field? I only talked about the electric field, right? In the quantum theory, there could be a magnetic field. Okay. so. Uh, it turns out uh, you don't generate this magnetic field uh, uh, in, in the finite order of perturbations. What I mean by this is that, uh, uh, you know, in this case, uh, usually the way that we generate a magnetic field is by allowing some local vacuum fluctuation. Uh, in this case, I can, I can create a vacuum fluctuation, but I have to move all these guys all the way to the uh, boundary of the system. Then I have to uh, uh, basically destroy them again. That, you know, that's the way that I can generate vacuum fluctuation. So because of this, because of this, the situation is somewhat like this. 
So I have this electric field square, magnetic field square, usual Hamiltonian. Um, the, the coefficient of B square term, for example, um, it turns out, um, uh, for example, uh, in the thermodynamic limit, this coefficient essentially goes to zero. So what that means is that uh, the, the speed of light, if you like, speed of light actually goes to zero in the thermodynamic limit. So for a finite system size, the velocity of light is finite. But when you increase system size, the photon velocity becomes slower and slower. The thermodynamic limit, it goes to zero. It's basically photon, you know, uh, a photon, photon, is a, photon basically becomes very, very slow in the, uh, in the thermodynamic limit. So this also means that it takes a, a very, very long time for the system to go from one degenerate ground state to the other degenerate ground state. And that's uh, related to this idea that uh, perhaps in this kind of system, there's some kind of uh, uh, glassing. It's what's, you know, this, is, this is what some people may call uh, a quantum glassy behavior. Okay. So uh, with that, I think I'm almost uh, into the time. So uh, uh, this is the summary. So I showed you uh, how we may construct uh, quantum spin model only with the two spin exchange interaction, the breathing particle is that, uh, you know, glasses of such a model may actually resemble some properties of the fractal phases. Uh, uh, the gap charge excitations can only move as a cluster at the edge of the membrane-like object, and there's a sub-extensive ground degeneracy that depends on lattice geometry. And in this case, uh, photons are sort of localized in the thermodynamic limit, but I hope uh, this gives us some clue as to what kind of realistic system we may want to look at uh, to find the fractonic phases in real material. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Questions? Sorry, I got confused about yeah. the, so, um, you know, for various of these uh, limits that you were introducing, you said you, you tune this parameter, yeah. you, you throw away the Kitayev exchange, this and that. Um, a, a, an honest to goodness fact on model is going to be stable to all local perturbations, right? That's right. So, so, uh, so, 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 sorry. so some properties, uh, some properties uh, robust, I would say. For example, uh, uh, you know, the, for example, the Gauss law constraint with the rank two field tensor. Uh, so that part is never changed. So the, you know, what, what by, by adjusting those parameters, what we are doing is uh, basically uh, simplifying the theory. Basically, we are, turn, we are, we are keeping only some, uh, some, some uh, matrix elements from the rank to, rank to field tensor, right? Mm -hmm. The reason for doing that is because if we do that, then uh, we can actually solve it. We can actually solve the model. For the genetic structure, we cannot solve it. So it is possible that uh, for some genetic choice of parameters, you may still have uh, a fractonic ground state in the sense that I described to you. It's just that uh, we don't know how to solve that model. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the choice of parameter is only for the purpose of uh, being able to solve it in some limit. I wanted to ask a bit about these localized uh, photons. So, so what spin excitation or is really the underlying sort of wave function for these photons? I mean, what is, is it, is it simply a local mode allowing around one of these tetrahedra or, or what is the physical yeah, it, of the actual it, wave function? Yeah, it has to be, it has to be some collective mode. It has to be collective mode of uh, uh, basically clusters of the spin. So, so, so you say it is some kind of a spin wave mode which is flat. Is that what this is saying at the end? It's not a spin wave. But some, how many, how many particles are involved to get a... So at least uh, uh, like a 16 spin. 16. I would say. So it's a, some big cluster. And yeah, I would say at least 16, because it involves a four nearby tetrahedron. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, so, the, so locally it has to be at least a 16 spin. A related question is, so what's, is that the entanglement length also for this thing? Or, or uh, could you say it? So, if I think about this particular spin model, 
Can you say anything about the entanglement length for the, for the, for the spins at the end? Entanglement length? In other words, there's some, again, there's some wave function for this thing. Yeah. And, and uh, can I just chunk it up into uh, such a set of classical subunits, which then, or, or, or not? And how big are those classical subunits? Is there some length scale which characterizes the um, um, entanglement in this? Yeah. Thing? I mean, the, the, the. That's related to localization, of course, yeah. right? If it's localized, then. So electric field, electric field correlator, you know, that, yeah. that's actually algebraically decaying. Okay. So in some sense, there is no uh, definite length scale. So it, it could be entangled all the way out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there could be. Yeah. Is that, there's no length scale, I mean, it's, it's just uh, decays algebraically. So it's possible then that something moves very much faster than the speed of light. So if I, if I make an observation on one side of the... Right, so, so that's not a photon, some other excitation. There's some other thing. Which yeah, some other excitation is not a photon. Yeah. The, the photon doesn't do that. The yeah. photon is, is limited. Yeah, in this case, those, those photons are basically mm -hmm. uh, yeah, slowed down. Actually, you know, the obstruction is actually the, comes from uh, the geometry of the lattice. For example, mm -hmm. I can add extra sight on this breathing particle lattice in such a way that philosophy of light becomes finite. It just is not a realistic lattice. Mm -hmm. On this particular lattice, uh, you know, basically there's an obstruction to do that. Mm -hmm. So geometry of the lattice basically prohibits this uh, propagation of the light in this case. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for these various degenerate ground states, I'm, I'm wondering if you know if this model has topological order in the sense that the ground states are uh, locally indistinguishable? So again, uh, this, this goes back to uh, uh, what I should say. Uh, um, so for example, if velocity of light was finite, then just like uh, ordinary quantum spin ice, for example, I could have obtained uh, some Quantum, unique quantum ground state. There will be a linear superposition of some of these degenerate ground state. So if, if, I, if I achieve that, then the ground state will be uh, ranked to uh, spin liquid instead of uh, this, right? But you cannot do that. So the, in, a, in a way, that's why uh, you end up with uh, uh, this, you know, degenerate ground state manifold. I think it's locally indistinguishable. Really, I mean, I would have. Do a local measurement. Okay, you think it's distinguishable or indistinguishable? I, I would have thought that they they should be distinguishable by local measurements. Like at least, if I mean, this model is a little bit more complicated, so it's hard for me to think about it because yeah. the electric fields don't commute. But in a model with commuting electric fields where there's no local magnetic field, then the ground states would just be sort of some you know, either crystals or random configurations in the electric field basis, and you can definitely tell them yeah. apart locally. But he, that's, so I'm kind of wondering if that same physics is also here, because it sounds like there, there's no local magnetic field operator, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not obvious to me though, that it so should be So for example, uh, you cannot simply apply a raising and lowering operator of the electric field. You always have to apply a raising and lowering operator together for example, only those operators are allowed, right? So you cannot arbitrarily uh, create a charge, you know, uh, one, one charge environment, you know, single locally. It always has to be a, a sort of, uh, what I should say, a correlated move. Also, uh, you know, in this, you know it, as, as I told you, um, the, the, the part, allowed values of electric fields are from minus two to plus two. So the, the uh, you know, essentially each degenerate ground state, each ground state is, is characterized by some assignment of uh, numbers like plus two, you know, minus two to plus two. You just have to satisfy this Gauss law. So, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at, uh, if, if you have a data that, that, that tells you uh, all the values of the electric field, then you can distinguish two phases. But if you're only looking at the, you know, some finite area, yeah, you know, you know some uh, electric field configuration. How do you know this is part of uh, the other degenerate ground state? 
if you know all the data, if you, if you know every electric field value at every lot, every lot this time, then I can distinguish them. But if, if, if I have a data only within a finite region in, in, in my lattice, then I cannot because I don't know whether this is part of the, this ground state or this is some other part of the, the other ground state. So in that sense, I think it's not distinguishable. I don't know. That's what I think. Okay. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, okay. I mean, we could be using different definitions, but it, it sounds like you could tell you know, like, for example, you could measure one of the local electric field operators, right? And that would have some value in some, it would have a certain value in some of the ground states and a different value in some other ground states, right? So I think at that's, that particular that's at some particular point. Yeah, and it doesn't, maybe it doesn't tell me everything about which ground state I'm in, but that, so that would mean, like, so, so then this, this wouldn't satisfy the topological order property that I'm thinking of, if, if that's but, true. But if you just pick a one side, then many, many ground states will have the same electric field value. That's, yeah, certainly that's yeah. true. You know, not all of them, but, but, but many of them will have the same electric field. So does it qualify as the criteria for distinguishing? Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, can you, if you keep making a sequence of successive measurements at, you but, know, you, but, but I think you have to make an infinite number you, of measurements. Well, at least uh, you have to measure all of them. Yeah, that maybe is. So that's, if 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 you use that, that definition, that's, that's that's probably okay. Yeah. We could, so I mean, if, we should if, talk about this more yeah, later. Yeah, if you use that definition, I yes, think taking but, making an infinite number if, of measurements yeah. is. Yeah. So is if okay. if you if you uh, use that definition, then they are distinguishable. I would say, if you can measure all of them. So uh, uh, coming back to the question, so, sorry, coming back to the question of going from exactly solvable models to closer to these kind of yeah. models which so I, I think in the last talk we were told about uh, so in, in the question that Senthil raised earlier about whether these extra terms are important in usual phases of matter we usually answer this in the sense that they are irrelevant under renormalization group and in the context of the previous talk we were introduced to a new notion yeah. of so <clears throat> Can, can, can we then interpret these extra terms that you dropped as being irrelevant under this new form of RG, this foliated or exotic I, RG? I don't know. I don't understand uh, this new form of RG, so I cannot answer that question. So maybe I was struggling to understand my stuff. So. Yeah, I, Sorry. I, I, I didn't listen to the whole question. <laughs> <laughs> I also can't. <laughs> yeah. You have a question? Yeah, no, I, I was very, I was listening carefully to the discussion between the two of you. So, uh, I, and I sort of had the same question, but let me maybe refine Mike's question in yeah. a form mm -hmm. that uh, perhaps would clarify what's going on, right? So, so in some of these, uh, within this degenerate manifold, the, uh, if I measure the electric field at some particular region, uh, some of these states will have different values of the electric field. Okay, so, so now, uh, uh, presumably the corollary is that I can uh, modify the Hamiltonian, perturb the Hamiltonian by having terms that uh, are linear in the electric field, mm -hmm. right, that weigh different electric field configurations differently. And that perturbation is a local perturbation, the sum of local terms, and that will lift the degeneracy. It will. Yes. Right. So then I think I agree with what you yeah, said. That's I, not a topological. Right. So I, I, I did that experiment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you do so, then it's basically adding, a, basically what you're saying is that I can add a potential term to, to, to the Hamiltonian, some potential term so that I can leave the degeneracy. I can do that. Then in that case, uh, ground set degeneracy actually uh, becomes smaller, but it's not completely gone. Then the real question is, what's the core? What's the intrinsic thing that cannot be lifted by local parameters? I actually, I don't know that answer. Actually, I, I stopped my investigation back. Oh. So, <laughs> but but uh, so 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 some of these properties still remain. The, the number becomes smaller, but the, some of these properties still stay. Like you know, it doesn't simply depends on either parameter volume, and and so so that property still stay. So yeah, I don't know what what is really the. Essence of the, in fact, uh, I didn't talk about this, but there is actually uh, some kind of self emergent self-system symmetry 
And that's actually protecting this degeneracy. So for each layer, for example. So it's, you know, it shows some properties of the uh, genetic fractal phase. You know, it's probably not as robust as the XQ model, I would say. But uh, you know, it's, it's hopeful, I would say. <laughs> okay, before we thank Young back again, let's ask, so are there any announcements we need to make before we finish the session? Okay, so everybody hopefully will join us for the, oh, you have an announcement, yeah. I think it's important just to remind everybody that the poster session starting time is also shipped. Oh, what's going, can you tell what time? What? Okay. Immediately after, okay. So great, so right now there's a coffee break, which I think is half an hour, right? And then there will post a session, so hopefully many of you will join us for the poster session and get the room crowded. Uh, with that said, let's close the session by thanking Yongbeck one last time.